So once again, thank you. And um, so I will focus on the issue of metastatic disease in male patients. So you have heard already two excellent talks and you know already also from experience that uh, breast cancer in males is a rare disease. And because fortunately most of them are not metastatic uh, and the risk of becoming metastatic is less frequent than the opportunity of becoming a survivor without a relapse. Having metastatic disease is even a rarer disease. So all the issues that you have heard about the lack of data, particularly the lack of dedicated specific data is true. But we have seen changes in this last couple of years and I'll, I'll point out some of those changes, fortunately. And these are my disclosures. So everything I'm going to tell you are in two important publications. One is the ASCO guideline for the management of breast cancer in male patients. And the other one is the several manuscripts that we have written regarding the advanced breast cancer consensus guidelines, where we have included recommendations for the management of metastatic disease in male patients since the beginning. So I would like to just go first to a little bit of definition of words that we use. So you have, you have heard that sometimes we say metastatic, sometimes we say advanced, and what is really the difference? So metastatic disease is when the breast, br the breast cancer has spread to distant sites. And in breast cancer, the most common distant sites are the lung, uh, the liver, the bones, the lymph nodes, and sometimes the brain. We also call this stage four breast cancer. Uh, there is another situation, and, and this you can see there in the PET scans images that I put there in the slide. So you can see that the disease is spread on your left, the, 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 the PET on your left shows a lot of bone metastasis. The pet on your right shows um, some metas uh, a lot of metastasis in the liver. But then there is another situation that it's called locally advanced disease, a disease that it's not possible to start with surgery. So it's inoperable. And that, those, that group of patients is sometimes lost between early disease and metastatic disease because they are neither one nor the other. So we, in the Global Alliance of the ABC Global Alliance, we have decided to use the word advanced breast cancer to include both of these situations. Now, why does a cancer become metastatic or advanced? So what you see there is a cartoon. In uh, green, you see the tumor. And tumor cells are actually our cells that have lost some uh, capacities and have gained other capacities. So for example, the cell, the tumor cells have lost the capacity to die. They have become immortal and they have gained the capacity to divide much more than any normal cell. So they divide, they use all their energy to multiply, but they also have gained the capacity to invade the blood vessels, for example. So they go away from the side where, where they the site where they are, they invade the blood vessels and they travel around our body. And that's why it is the breast cancer that goes to the liver or the lung or the bones. It's not that you have a, a new cancer in the bone or in the liver. So that's the reason why the cancer cells go and give metastases that are actually small tumors coming from the primary tumor and appearing in another organ. So um, what we know and what you see there are mostly data from females, but the situation is the same for male, uh, male patients with metastatic disease. So unlike the early setting where we have seen 
substantial improvements and sustained improvements over time, for metastatic disease for a long time, the medium survival had remained between two and a half years, three years. And there was very little improvement over the years. And there was a lot of reasons for that. And we can come back to that in the discussion. But fortunately, in these last maybe five years, we have seen an improvement, particularly in two subtypes. We have seen an improvement in the HER2 positive subtype. And you see there on your left, the final data of a very important trial called Cleopatra, looking in, into anti-HER2 therapy and showing that with that therapy, we can reach a medium of five years of survival. And more recently, with a therapy called a CDK for six inhibitors, like ribocyclib or abemacyclib, we have also seen an improvement in survival with a medium survival going beyond five years as well. And I'll make here two points. One, when we say medium survival, it means that 50% of patients live longer and 50%, unfortunately, will live uh, less than five years. That's what we mean by saying a medium survival. And we, um, we will focus a, much more on this ER positive, HER2 negative subtype. Uh, but before we go into the, the details of the treatment, I wanted to go explain to you what is our rationale when we treat someone with metastatic disease. So unfortunately, metastatic disease for the moment, most of the time is incurable. And so we have to make this balance between quantity of life, meaning improving survival and quality of life. Doing that with treatments that do not have too much toxicity. So our goals in this setting are to improve survival, obviously, delay the progression of the disease if we and prolong the duration of response, take care of symptoms, so control the symptoms, and improve or maintain a good quality of life. And perhaps in the future, we will be able to um, transform the, this disease into a chronic disease. When we, if we have our goal to treat for as long as possible, with a good quality of life, there are a couple of notions that we should know. Toxicity profile is very crucial in the metastatic setting. It is for all patients, obviously, and in the early setting as well, but here is even more important. And those reductions are acceptable in the metastatic set, uh, setting. They are often needed and they are better than having to interrupt the treatment because toxicity was too high. Oral treatments, whenever possible, are better than IV treatments. They are more convenient. They allow you to, the patient to keep the professional responsibilities or others, and they are also cost-effective. And we always speak about patient preferences, but more than ever in a situation uh, where we have this delicate balance between quantity and quality of life, we really have to listen to, for example, what type of toxicity that individual patient wants to avoid. Now, we speak about individualization of treatment or treatment tailoring. And in the metastatic setting, that's even more important. And we can we can individualize the treatment, focus on characteristics of the tumor or characteristics of the patient. And what you see there in the slide is a, a list of many factors that we need to take into account. Some of them are biological factors. Others are factors related to the patient, such as the age, the comorbidity, so other diseases, uh, also socioeconomic, psychological factors, et cetera. So we can summarize this into patient preferences always, patient characteristics, like we mentioned, 
disease characteristics. So have we, has the patient received already some treatment before or not? And tumor characteristics, meaning the biology and the biomarkers of, of the tumor. So in oncology today, whatever the cancer, we have two main problems. How to select the patients, which patients are going to benefit the most from the treatment that we have, and something called tumor resistant, the resistance that I will explain to you uh, very shortly. So what are the solutions we've been trying to use is to identify targets in the cancer cell and develop then treatments against those targets. This is one of the goals of precision medicine. However, we hear about precision medicine a lot and we hear about many biomarkers and about doing sequencing of all the tumors. But what I've shown, what I show you here are the biomarkers for which we can do something and that we can use to uh, adapt our treatment. So the most important ones are the estrogen receptor and the HER2 receptor. Also very important, the BRCA mutations. And then there is another mutation called PI3CA, which is important particularly in the ER positive HER2 negative subtype. Then there is a, another biomarker important for triple negative, but as you have heard, Dr. Giordano, we almost don't have triple negative in uh, male patients, so we are not going to go into those details. What is very crucial is to have a high quality pathology and to ask the biomarker if we can have access to the targeted uh, treatment. I will make a, a point here, maybe an important take home message is that if you are diagnosed with a ER negative breast tumor and you are a male, you should ask for a repetition, a revision of the pathology because it is extremely rare that the, the estrogen receptor is negative. And if particularly if you're diagnosed with triple negative disease, then it really has to be verified. Even the HER2, we can see it in about 10% of cases, but we should verify it before um, starting to give any treatment. So going back to the other problem, which is tumor resistance. So what is that um, exactly? So let's look at this slide from your left to your right. So you have a tumor and the tumor, as you can see there in the image, is composed of different cells. That's what we call tumor heterogeneity, meaning that the tumor is not the same. There is differences in the cells that compose the tumor. You start by giving the best treatment according to our knowledge. Usually there is a response and the tumor becomes smaller. But after a while, the tumor develops the capacity to escape the treatment that we are giving. That is what we call resistance. So it, even if you continue giving the treatment, it will start to regrow. And you see that it grows more aggressive with more heterogeneity, more different cells. We call this progression of the disease. So what can we do here? We have to find a different treatment, something that the cell is not expecting, the cancer cell is not expecting, so that we can again have a response. And this is the natural history of metastatic disease. You give a treatment, it works for a while. It may be several years, several months, or several weeks. And then it stops working and you have to change treatment. And this is why sometimes it's referred to as a roller coaster. You are well, and then suddenly the tumor starts growing again. And then we change the treatment and you are well again. And that's um, the natural Easter of this disease. But what does that mean? It means that we should find a way to evaluate the biology of the disease when the disease becomes metastatic. So we always advocate to have a biopsy of the metastasis. But act actually, since the biology is changing, we should find a way to have a serial evaluation of the biology. 
And it's very hard to do serial biopsies. It's very uncomfortable to do this. And so that's why we are looking into the liquid biopsies to help us. And you will have a, a talk about that later on. But that's one of the goals of the liquid biopsies is to try to understand what happens to the biology of the disease with time. What this also tells us is that we need several treatments in the metastatic setting. Having access to just one is not enough. We need several to be able to change the treatment when the disease is not responding anymore. So what are, in general, the types of treatments that we have? We have chemotherapy that everybody uh, knows. And the chemotherapy, the, the target of chemotherapy is the cell that is dividing very quickly, okay? So it will kill the tumor cells, but also good cells that also have this characteristic of dividing quickly. For example, our hair, but also the mucosa of our digestive tract. That's why sometimes some chemotherapy gives some nausea and vomiting or diarrhea, for example. So this is the, the reason why we have some sort of side effects with chemotherapy. And then we have targeted therapy. So remember that image of defining the target and finding a drug that goes against that target. The first example is endocrine therapy, which we have discussed uh, already in detail. So if there is the estrogen receptor, we can find treatments that target the estrogen receptor. And the same happens for the HER2 positive. We have to find treatments that target the HER2 receptor. So as Dr. Giordano explained to you, male breast cancer is almost always ER positive, HER2 negative. So I'm going to focus now on the treatments for this subtype. And what I will show you are the um, ABC or Advanced Breast Cancer Guidelines. What does it say here is that for this subtype, which represents the majority of cases, endocrine-based therapy is the preferred option. Even if you have what we call visceral disease, what does this mean? Even if there are liver metastases or lung metastases, endocrine-based therapy is the most efficacious, much more than chemotherapy. And what we um, recommend, and, and also the ASCO guidelines recommend, is that we use several lines of it, of this endocrine-based therapy. And we only go to chemotherapy if there is no response or if you are out of options. There is a situation though that it's called there visceral crisis that may lead us to go for chemotherapy. So what is that the visceral crisis? It's a busy slide, but I, I'll guide, I guide you through it. So visceral crisis is not that you have just the, the, the metastasis in the liver or the lung. It means that those metastases are leading to organ dysfunction. So the organ is not functioning properly. And this means that you have to act very quickly. Sometimes the most, the treatment that acts faster is chemotherapy, not always, but most of the times. So let's say, let's give some example. If there are liver metastases, but your liver is functioning well, and we can see that in the blood test, then we continue to give endocrine therapy. But if your liver starts not functioning well, for it, but in this case, we need a specific enzyme, bilirubin, to start increasing, then we have a problem there and we have to act very quickly. The same with lung. If we may have several metastases in the lung, but it, it's only when we have shortness of breath that we are not controlling well, that we can say that we are in a visceral crisis. And this happens in about 10, 15% of patients in the first line setting. So this is a, a, a cartoon to try to explain how the endocrine therapy works. And we have already discussed this with the two previous talks, but since I heard some of your questions, I'll try to explain again. So you see on your left, there is the estrogen receptor. So the estrogen receptor is activated with what 
the what we call the ligand, which is the estrogen, the E. And the E binds to the estrogen receptor, and that's when the es estradiol can lead to its effects. Some of its effects are good, some not so good. In terms of the cancer cell, estradiol feeds the cancer cell and leads the, tells the cancer cell to divide. So how do we block this? We can block the receptor. That's what two treatments do. One of them is tamoxifen. It blocks the receptor. So even if you have a high estrogen level, and this goes to the question of the gentleman that asked, what about my high estrogen level? Since tamoxifen blocks the receptor, even if you do have slightly high estradiol, it won't be able to act in the cancer cell because the receptor is blocked. There is another agent that blocks the receptor that it's called fulvestrin. And now in the new treatments, there are others being developed such as oral surds and other treatments that are blocking the estrogen receptor. Another way of acting here is to decrease the levels of estradiol. How do we do that? We do it with aromatase inhibitors. They function in women after the menopause. Why? Because after the menopause, the estradiol in women are no longer produced by the ovaries, but are produced by fat and the liver. And aromatase inhibitors work there. For women before the menopause and men, estradiol is produced also a little bit in fat and liver, but most of the most of the estradiol in premenopausal women is produced by the ovaries, and in men, about 20% is produced by the testicles. So if we use an aromatase inhibitor alone, we still have produ production of estradiol. So for, for premenopausal women and men, we have to add what we call an LHRH agonist, for example, Zolidex or Lucrine, because what they will do is stop the production by the testicles also, okay? I hope I have clarified some of the things, not complicated more. So what about now the treatment recommendations? For the first line treatment, but even for men who have taken tamoxifen in the early setting, tamoxifen is still our preferred option in male patients with metastatic disease. But as I showed you, we will need at a certain point to change treatment and tamoxifen will not work forever. So what do we do after? Well, we can use an aromatase inhibitor and preferably, for the reasons I explained to you, with an LHRH agonist. Or we can choose not to use the LHRH agonist, but then we have to monitor very closely to see if there is response or not. Okay, What would be the problem of using this LHRH agonist is that the major side effects is to induce impotency. So there will be no sexual life. And that's why we try to avoid uh, combining this agent. I will skip this because already uh, Dr. Giordano spoke about this uh, situation, about feedback loop. Now, what about all the other treatments that we have, particularly the targeted agents? So the recommendations from the ABC uh, consensus guidelines and the ASCO guidelines is that male patients must be treated with the same options as female patients with metastatic disease. So for that, we have already spoken about not excluding patients from trials just because they are male. And fortunately, the FDA issued this guidance uh, already uh, three years ago in 2020. It took quite a while because we've been fighting for decades for that, but finally they did. And they say that, that the eligibility criteria for clinical trials should allow both males and females. And so we all need to fight because I can tell you that this is happening in some trials, not all trials. And particularly trials with endocrine therapy, they are continuing to exclude male patients. And we cannot let them do that because 
Otherwise, we will not have data on important endocrine therapy options. So, the standard of care today for the first line setting, both for females and for males, is a drug called CDK46 inhibitor that we don't use alone, but we use combining with uh, an endocrine agent. For example, with fulvestrand or with aromatase inhibitor, we can also combine some of these agents with tamoxifen. For example, we can combine abemacyclib with tamoxifen. We cannot combine ribocyclib with tamoxifen because of a cardiac side effect. And we can use these in first line or second line. And, um, and as you see there, this is for all patients women and men. Now, where this, this data come from? So we have several trials, which I summarize in just two slides, showing a very consistent benefit of these agents. And in the first line setting, they prolong survival more than a year. So we have seen that specific, especially with ribocyclib and abemacyclib, so more than a year of benefit. Uh, and this is another example. What you see there is, like I pointed out, we now have more than five years medium survival with this combination. And there is no chemotherapy that can provide such an important benefit. We, by using this combination, we also delay the need for chemotherapy for more than a year with obvious impact on quality of life. If we cannot use it in first line for some reason, we can use it in second line. They also prolong survival a little bit less, six to nine months, but there's also no chemotherapy that provides this benefit. What we cannot do, and we don't have data that allows us to do that, is to use in first line and then continue to use in second line. So once there is a progression, we should stop uh, these agents. Now, do we have data in male patients? We do. So there are some of these trials allowed for men to enter. And so we have a couple of men included in some of these trials. And we also have some real world evidence. This is an example of this real world evidence. There are others with, uh, this was with palbocyclib. There are others with the other agents showing that the drugs work equally in male patients as they do in female patients. So the summary for the treatment of this subtype, which is the majority of the uh, male patients with metastatic disease, is that unless you have a situation of visceral crisis where maybe chemotherapy might be better, there is maybe a small percentage also with low burden of disease, meaning very low metastas metastatic sites, where perhaps we can give hormonal therapy alone, but for the majority of patients, we recommend hormonal therapy and then a CDK46 inhibitor. Now, for those of you who may come from countries or uh, regions where you don't have access to CDK46 inhibitor because they are quite expensive, and the second best treatment is endocrine therapy, not chemotherapy. In terms of chemotherapy, just like Dr. Giordano show for the early breast cancer, the recommendations are the same. Chemotherapy works the same way in male or female. So these are the same recommendations for female patients, meaning what I told you in the beginning. Uh, we should use oral drugs when possible. We should use one drug at a time, so monotherapy, not combination, because that increases toxicity and it does not increase efficacy. And I'm showing you also the ASCO guidelines so that you can see that the recommendations are exactly the same. So they, the guidelines are very consistent and, 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 see this, and say the same thing. In terms of the other targeted agents, uh, I will briefly, so I will still mention this diagram that shows the different options that we have for ER positive, HER2 negative. On your right, you have chemotherapy options. On your left, 
endocrine-based therapy options. And I'll point out here, after we use a CDK46 inhibitor, there are a couple of options. One of them is directed to this important pathway that it's called mTOR PI3K pathway. Why am I saying this? Because we have some data in the preclinical setting for male breast cancer, this pathway is particularly important and it's very often overactivated. So these agents that target this pathway can be particularly important for male patients. Unfortunately, we do not have clinical data to prove that that is correct. But we have these agents and we can use them in clinical practice. And so that those are very good options after a CDK46 inhibitor. There is, as you can see here, there are a lot of trials going on with many new therapies. These will come. And as I told you, some of them are allowing patients, uh, male patients to enter. But what I'm very concerned is that the hormonal therapy, new hormonal therapy drugs, the trials are not allowing male patients to come to enter the trials. And uh, I think this is where Sherry and everyone need to speak up because we I've tried and I know Sharon have tried and Caroline have tried, but our voices are not loud enough. So I hope that your voices are loud enough because we need new hormonal therapy options for male patients as well. What about the HER2 positive? I'm not going to go into the details. This would be a very long talk. I'm just saying that for this subtype, all new agents, they can be used equally in male patients as in female patients. So there is no need for the treatment to be different in case of those 10% that have HER2 positive disease. Um, so we'll have a talk about genetic counseling. I just wanna make one point. So all patients should be offered the genetic counseling and testing. In the metastatic uh, setting, it's also important because we have a drug that is called the PARP inhibitor, like Olaparib, for example, that we can use in the metastatic setting. But for that, we need the BRCA to be tested so that we can also have this option of treatment. And never to forget in this setting that we need what we call supportive therapy for this would allow us to control the symptoms and to be able to give the anti-cancer treatment. And we also need what we call palliative care, for example, pain control. And pain control is very inexpensive and not, very, not always properly given. And it's ex extremely important to control the pain. And of course, accessibility to the treatments is really important. And tr uh, Treatment of pain, for example, using morphine is inexpensive. And I know that the problem of opioids in the States has another very big problem that it's not allowing cancer patients to have easy access to pain uh, treatment. And we all have to continue to fight for that. We, I know there is a misuse of opioids, but sometimes they are very important in the metastatic setting. So we already spoke about many of the specific issues of having this cancer for a male to have this cancer. Now, there is the stigma of having a female cancer, but there's always also a stigma for having metastatic cancer. And that happens to both female and male. And I'll uh, invite you to go into the BBC Global Alliance site and see this short uh, movie and also other uh, small, uh, small videos, including a male patient testimony about the stigma of having metastatic disease. It's a very short movie, uh, one minute and a half, but it's a very powerful uh, movie. And the two last um, slides, just to tell you that we have created this Advanced Breast Cancer Global Alliance, which has grown a lot. We have now more than 263 members in more than 100 
countries and our members are organizations and uh, the male breast cancer coalition is um, the male breast cancer global alliance is also a member of this global alliance and the goal is to share our resources and our knowledge with all patients around the world we have made this charter with goals that we want to tackle all together including accessibility to care so that will be very important and that's why next week we're going to have the seventh abc conference where we'll update the guidelines so hopefully you can join even if you cannot come to lisbon uh, there is a virtual um, access so please uh, join it thank you very much